Dynamic programming is one of those topics that strike fears into the heart of many computer science students. Luckily for us, dynamic programming, like everything else in the coding interview, is just an algorithm. So basically, it is just a clever brute force optimizing the runtime by building up the solution from solving and reusing from many subproblems. To help us understand dynamic programming, in this video, we'll talk about the top down approach or the memoization. So, in this problem, we're going to try to count different ways to get to end step. We can either take one or two steps at a time. So, to demonstrate the climbing stair problem, we drew out this lovely stair. And we have our input of B3, so we have three stairs. And the expected output is three, because there are three combinations. And let me show you how to reach them. So starting from the top stair, we can take one step, another one step, and a third one step. And that'll give us one possible combination of steps. Alternatively, we can take one step, and then two step. And that'll give us another combination. And then finally, we, we can take two steps and then one step, and that'll give us our third output. So let me give you an intuition how to solve it recursively. Starting at our root case, or we can either take one step, minus one, we get to three, or we can do minus two and get to two. So we try out all these combinations. Um, so let's look at the subtree of the value three. So if we take one step, we get three. If we take another minus one step, we get two. Another minus one, we get to one. Another minus one, we get to zero. So now that we at zero, we know that we have achieved the correct pattern. Um, so that's one solution. Over here on at two, if we take minus two step, we also get to zero, which is also a valid solution as well. Then here, if you minus 2 and minus 1, this is solution minus 1, minus 2, minus 1. So these all give us the good solution. And as Josh mentioned earlier, if we were, let's say, for example, um, this is an invalid case. If we do a minus 2, we will get a minus 1. In this case, this is not valid. So we're going to return a 0. In this example, we've actually calculated a lot, some of the the steps multiple times. For example, we calculated. Oops, what's the highlighting? We calculated the ones multiple times, and we also calculated the twos. Where's my highlighting? Oh well, that's fine. We also calculated the two multiple times. Now, for a small number of stairs, like n equals four, that might not seem like a big deal. However, once n becomes something bigger, like 100, we'll see a lot of repeat calculation, 2 to the 100 specifically. So to solve this problem and make our algorithm more optimal, that's when we introduce dynamic programming. So let's me take you to the next step. In our base case, if n is less than 0, we would like to return a 0 back. This demonstrates that we have already walked too far. And on step two, if n is already in our cache, we can just reuse the value. And finally, step three, if n is equal to zero, we have reached our nth step, so we would like to return one back. So our recursive case is when n is greater than zero, or basically when we have not reached an answer. So when we have, we are in this situation, we would just try doing two things. We either take one step, or we would try taking two steps. And because this problem wants us to find all of the possible paths, we would just need to sum both of the answers that we would come across together to get our answer. And normally that's all we need to do for a recursion problem. However, because this is a DP problem, we actually take one extra step, and that is to use the cache that we talked about earlier and store the value so that if we ever see it again, we can just return that value and not do the extra work of calculating everything again. All right, so let me demonstrate how this works. Um, so it's step four, which is a root node. First, we're checking if the answer already existed in our cache. In this case, it is not, so we're gonna continue our calculation. We're gonna take two steps. Either we go take one step or take two steps. But uh, in an actual algorithm, we're gonna go into our minus one step first, um, depending on how you implement them. Uh, so at minus one, we get three. 
We're checking if 3 existed in our cache, in this case, which it is not, so we need to continue with our calculation. Again, if we minus 1 on the left hand side, uh, we're gonna get minus two. we're gonna get two. Two never exists in our cache. We keep going. We minus one. One never exists in our cache. We do another minus one. We get the zero, which in this case will hit our base case. And we're gonna go ahead and write zero into our cache. Um, let's update one. Thank you, Josh. So we are back now into a node of value one. We're gonna write this value one, uh, the value of, before we return back, we're gonna update our cache. So let me demonstrate what happens when we take in minus two on this node over here. So this will give us a minus one, which is less than zero, which is an invalid case. So we're gonna exit out right away without updating our cache, and we'll just return back up. So back at one now, uh, we know that our answer here is gonna be taking our answer on the left node and the right child. Uh, add them together. This is gonna give us a answer of one, and we're gonna take that and update it our cache. So now we're back at two. At two, we know that previously when our minus one will give us an answer of one, but we need still need to go to our minus two. And our minus two, two minus two give us a zero, which will hit our base case, and this will return a one back as well. So now we would we will have an answer of our left child, which will return a one, and a right child, which also return a one. So on step uh, number two, it will give us an answer. And let's go back to three. On three, we did our minus one already, so we want to go to minus two, which in this case will give us a one. A one, luckily, already existed in our cache, so we're going to pull that out. Um, and it will just return a one back, so we don't have to repeat the same calculation again. Josh, for writing that in. So on three here, we will take our answer two plus one, which is three, so we're going to write three into our cache and we're gonna return the value back. So now we at root four. Um, on root four, our left subtree has the value of three, but we still need to do the calculation of minus two. And this four minus two will give us a two. Luckily, two has already existed in our cache, so we can just go ahead and reuse it. Um, so that's gonna give us the value of two on the right subtree. So now four, we can take the left plus the right subtree values, so 3 plus 2, which is equal to 5. We're going to write that into the cache and return the answer. So I'll talk about the runtime complexity of both our recursive brute force recursive solution and our DB problem. So for our brute force recursive solution, the runtime is O of 2 to the power of n. And that is because for every one step we have to take, for every n step from 0 to all the way to n, there are two possible st uh, decisions that we can make. We either take one step or two step. And we have to do that for all n steps, giving us the runtime of 2 to the power of n. Now, thank God we have dp because that helps us optimize the problem significantly. With dp, we only need to calculate every single uh, subproblem of n, so basically zero through n, one time, and then we store the answer inside a our cache. And then if we ever see the problem again, we can just reuse the answer we calculated, which is a O of one lookup, giving us a runtime of O of n. As for space complexity, you might assume that the proof for solution is also huge, but actually both problem has a space complexity of O of n. And for a brute force solution, the reason for that is even the worst case scenario where we only take one step, if we go recursively go through all n steps, we will actually only take, well, n steps, and we would store all of that as a stack inside our, inside our program. And as a result, and then when we start going back, we'll start popping it out. 
from our stack. So worst case scenario will always be, we'll always have at most n. Now for DP, that's probably more intuitive. We have, we're storing n solutions inside our array. So as a result, we have a runtime of n. Thank you, Scott, by the way. And that is our runtime in space-time complexity. All right, so first let's define our helper methods and we need to check our base cases. If n is less than zero, equal to zero, and if n has already existed in our cache, if that's true, we're just gonna go ahead and return back the result. And lastly, before we forget, we need to write the result back into our cache by taking either one or two steps and combine those two together. And that's about it. So if you made it this far into our video, please like and subscribe 